Chapter 1. Essential Ideas. We'll begin with section 1.1, Chemistry in Context. Chemistry is the study of the composition, properties, and interactions of matter. Essentially, in this course, we are going to be looking at matter. What is it composed of? What properties does it have? What happens when matter interacts with one another? We're going to be looking at all the different elements in the periodic table. Now, when I say matter, I mean anything that occupies a volume and has a mass. Now, chemistry is often termed the central science. Understanding chemistry is helpful to unlocking and understanding a variety of different fields. Biochemistry, environmental science, geochemistry, agriculture, nuclear chemistry, physics. Chemistry is directly related to mathematics, chemical physics, nanoscience, material science, chemical engineering. It has a hand in toxicology, in medicine, in biology, in food science. Chemistry is a major player in STEM. Almost every STEM field requires some understanding of chemistry in some way. Now we're going to start here with looking at the scientific method. So I'm sure everyone in this course is generally familiar with the scientific method and its steps. So the scientific method, we want to start with an observation or with a curiosity. You notice something happens and you want to understand, well, why did that thing just happen? So you'll start with forming a hypoth hypothesis, making a prediction. So you're going to attempt to explain, well, why did this thing happen? And you want to design an experiment. So you want to make a prediction. I think this thing happened because of X, Y, Z. So then we're going to perform an experiment to test that hypothesis and make more observations. Now, after you perform the experiment, if the results from this experiment are not consistent with your prediction, then you need to form a new hypothesis, make a new prediction, and design a new experiment. Now, if your results are consistent with the prediction, then your hypothesis now contributes to the body of knowledge. Now, generally, a hypothesis, after it's been tested, it can go one of two ways. Either it can become a law or it can become a theory. Now, theories do not become laws. Theories and laws are two distinctly separate things, and we're going to look at them here in the coming slides. Now, first, let's briefly explain what we mean when we say observation. So an observation, it can be qualitative or it can be quantitative. So we can perform experiments, we can gather data, or we can use our senses to discover things about the world. So an observation asks what just happened. So for example, a ball was dropped and had an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is an observation. Now this is a very quantitative observation. So for example, if I had a ball in my hand and I dropped it, a qualitative observation would be when I drop the ball, or when I let go of the ball, the ball drops to the floor. That describes what happened, but it's just generally qualitatively describing what happened. Whereas let's say I had someone ready with a timer, and I measure the distance from my hand to the floor, and then I drop the ball, and I had the person, person measure how long it took from the ball to drop to the floor, and then I use this to do some math and determine the acceleration of the ball. Well, this is still an observation, but now this is a more quantitative observation. Now I have measured something. So let's talk about what a law is. So when a hypothesis is proven correct and it contributes to the body of knowledge, this hypothesis may become a law. And so laws still explain what. So they laws are a pattern or trend in observations in data. They're a brief summary of things that will always happen. So they still describe what happens. So for example, the law of gravity or this uh, the law based upon a uh, force so f force equals mass times acceleration this is a scientific law so laws are kind of like machines you put data in you get data out or you put observations in you get predictions out and they are consistent and repeatable they don't tell you why they don't explain why they are still just telling you what happens when this happens something else happens so for example you could look at the relationship between uh, barometric pressure and a change in the weather. So you could say when the barometric pressure drops, a storm comes or something like this. This is a meteorological law. This just tells you what happens. This doesn't explain why the pressure dropping leads to a storm, but it just tells you what happens. So laws tell you what. 
Now, a hypothesis, this is a tentative explanation for observation. So a hypothesis or hypotheses, they ex attempt to explain why. So they are specific, they are testable, and they are generally in the form of an if-them statement. So for example, apples fall from trees because of gravity. If I move an apple to outer space where there's no gravity, then it should not fall. So this is an attempt to explain why. Now, a theory, the word theory, the word theory is very overused. It's misunderstood in the public domain. In scientific terms, it is only when a hypothesis has withstood the test of time that it can be considered a theory. So the, uh, the Big Bang Theory or the theory of evolution, at one time, these were new ideas. They were hypotheses, but they withstood the test of time. They have been rigorously and repeatedly tested, and they have still held up. So now they, can be, they are considered to be scientific theories. So theories explain why. So the difference between a theory and a law. For example, if we looked at gravity, so I said, if I drop a ball, it will fall and accelerate at the rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. We can say this is the law of gravity, or at least on Earth. Things fall because of gravity. This just tells you what is going to happen. If I drop a ball, what happens? This is the law of gravity. Whereas the theory of gravity would att attempt to explain, well, why does the ball fall when I drop it. Or if we looked at um, Einstein's relativity, if we looked at the curvature of space-time, right? Very large, massive bo bodies, they bend space-time. So this causes, this essentially is, this is why we think gravity exists. So this explains why. So theories explain why. Laws tell us what happens. And theories, they are when a hypothesis has withstood the test of time that it can be considered a theory. So just someone coming up with a hypothesis, an idea, this does not automatically grant it the status of a theory. It has to withstand the test of time to be considered a theory. And there's a brief video here about the difference between a theory and a law. I strongly recommend you download the PowerPoint slides and you check out this link. It's a brief five minute video and it uses some helpful visuals to really hammer home the idea and the difference between a theory and a law. All right, here is a knowledge check question. Which term defines a tentative explanation for observations? Okay, the correct answer is B hypothesis. A hypothesis is a tentative explanation for observations. All right, last part of this section is I want to hit on the three domains of chemistry. So we're going to be looking at the macroscopic, the microscopic, and the symbolic domain. So the macroscopic domain is, you know, things in the physical world, things that we can see with our eyes, like a large block of ice or a big iceberg or ice cubes in a glass. This is the macroscopic domain. These are things that we can see with our eyes and then we can touch and interact with easily. The microscopic domain, things we can't see with our eyes, so things at the molecular domain. So this is what water looks like at the molecular domain. When water is in its gaseous form, we've got these, ga these water molecules, they are all separate from one another. When we are in the solid domain, we are in much more ordered. So this is a much more ordered domain, but this is what water looks like at a microscopic level. And then here's what water looks like at the liquid level. The domain we'll primarily be working with in this course is the symbolic domain. So this is how we represent elements and molecules symbolically. So here the letters represent elements. The subscripts, we'll talk about what the subscripts mean, but they represent the number of those atoms. And then here in the parentheses, these are called uh, state of matter symbols or phase symbols. It tells you what state of matter that element or compound is in. So here the G means gas, the S means solid, and the L means liquid. Okay, that concludes this section. I will see you in the next video when we will talk about section 1.2, phases and classifications of matter.